Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover. I suspect we'll be looking at uh, John the Baptist again for another couple class periods. Uh, we were really making good progress there, and uh, the gospel meeting threw a wet blanket on our John the Baptist discussion, so, but it was pretty good, so I'd say it was worth it, but, uh, but no, uh, we, if you remember, we were um, really had just gotten to uh, where he was not born yet, and uh, we were talking about the announcement of his birth, and we're really just going to continue there, and we're going to try to just get into uh, his life. There's so much to learn from, from his life and some of the, um, the things before he was born, and then, of course, in his ministry. Um, all right, let's bow and pray, and then we'll begin. <clears throat> Our Father, we're thankful to you for all the blessings we have. We're thankful for this time that we have to be together in peace, and that we can encourage each other and honor you in all the things that we do here. We're thankful to you for your word. We're thankful that you have given it to us so that we can learn it and understand it personally and that we can apply it in our lives and that we can know you. We're thankful more than anything for your son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for his sacrifice. We're thankful for your grace and your mercy that you show us through him. And we pray all these things in his name and amen. I, would, I won't take much time to review because we have so much to cover, but you remember we talked a little bit about baptism and the importance of understanding baptism in, in this society and how it had been part of even the old law and this cleansing, these, these Im immersion cleansing rituals. And then John the Baptist was baptizing, and then we of course know the baptism into Jesus Christ that we'll learn about. This, what we're going to study tonight is going to show that transition, is going to show, give us a little insight into this baptism of John and then the baptism of Jesus that we'll learn about. But as we talked about, um, we kind of, uh, we're doing a flashback right now because we talked about uh, Jesus and how John sent his disciples to Jesus to ask if he was the one that they should expect or if they should look for another. And Jesus talked about, first of all, he said, tell them what you've seen. Go tell John the Baptist, what you've seen here, these miracles that you've seen, and then just talked about how important John the Baptist was in the world, where he said, you know, or, you know he said, to those, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And this, to me, these two statements are really important, where he talks about how important a role John the Baptist was playing but that his whole job was this transition, that even though he was a great man, and he, Jesus said it himself, he is paving the way for all of us to be great in the kingdom. And he alludes to Elijah, and that he is in this, the same spirit and the same mission as Elijah, and refers to Isaiah 40, the voice of one calling out, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Malachi 3, behold, I am sending my messenger and he will clear a way before me. Real quick, let's just review why was a messenger needed? Why is it that there was this prophecy that said there will be a messenger that comes to prepare the way, calling out from the wilderness why was that needed at this time? Any thoughts on that? Yes, sir. There was a time where prophets were coming and they were delivering messages and they were being confirmed and the people were listening and, they, and there was this continuous reminder and these prophets bringing this word. Well, now it's hundreds of years have passed and a, and a new prophet has come a prophet that, that, that had been foretold. And they needed to be reminded. A long time had passed. Uh, Americans, we have really short memories. There are things where we will just dedicate ourselves to a purpose or to an idea, and it's not months before we forget about that and move on to something else. This is hundreds of of years that have, happened, that have passed, they needed to be reminded. Any other things you would say about what, why it is that a messenger needed to come? I would say we need to be very clear. People had turned from God. This was not just a needed a reminder, just a, a, a you know, kind of little prodding. 
there is this indication that when John came, he was preaching a baptism of what? Repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He was coming and preparing the way by turning people back to God. There had been a lull. People had forgotten. They had not maintained their dedication. They had turned from God. They were not getting it right. And now it was time for the Messiah to make himself known. And he came to say, turn the people. And and we learn that even in these prophecies. Um, The idea of turning the people's eyes back to God. So we could say a lot about that. We're going to uh, continue on. And we, we mentioned last time this idea of the uh, announcing of the king. The idea of a kings are going to arrive. Well, there needs to be someone that goes out and announces, you know, this, hear ye, hear ye, the king is arriving. He's coming. Let's be ready for this. Let's prepare. You know, in, the, in small ways, we do that now. We... You might let our house go a little bit. We might let our house be untidy just a little bit. But then when people are coming, it's time to put on, you know, get it ready. Get everything ready because some people are coming over that we want to be prepared for. With the king, it is, it's been a long time. We heard the Messiah was coming. We didn't know when, but it's coming now. It's time to get ready for him to come. Now, we, we went through the story, and I don't want to spend the time to go through it again, but we went through the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and their infertility, and that they now were both advanced in years. We might just say old. They were too old to have children. And how did they, how, what was their reaction to this? What was Zechariah and Elizabeth's reaction to not having children? Well, what did they laugh at? Yes, the fact that they would have children was preposterous to them. But their reaction to not having children was they were crestfallen. Elizabeth was sad, and in fact, there was this indication that they were shameful about that. The fact that they did not have children at this age, they felt like they were, in in this society, had shame on them for not, for not having children. Yes, Neil? You also have to remember that that prayer was probably prayed 30 years ago. <laughs> that, that they would have children. The, 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 age to have children. The, the fact that, you know, they, this is another thing. Maybe they didn't remember. Maybe they, didn't, you know, maybe they thought this wasn't a possibility. But then when they were told, when an angel came and said, you will have a child, this is what they wanted the most. This is the thing they most wanted. But the reaction was, laughter and was, wait, hold on, how is this possible? Now, I always, I'd make fun of it a little bit because an angel had come and uh, was speaking to him, yet he was saying, how, how is this possible? How, how, could, how could it possibly be that you would give us a child? And his um, consequence was what? He was made mute. And this was just, you know, may have been a punishment But also it was to just demonstrate the reality of this, to demonstrate the the gravity of the situation. So it does tell us that um, she became pregnant, kept herself in seclusion for five months, and it says in uh, Luke 1, in verse 25, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among the people. She took time, she was thankful for this, and she took time to focus on God And she says that God is giving me a child, and this is removing my disgrace among the people. That is how serious it was to her that they were not able to have children. Let's go on now um, and look at Luke 1 and verse 39. And it tells us about, um, now we bring Mary into the story, and we learn in verse 39, now at this time Mary set out and went into went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out in a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt in my womb for joy." 
and blessed is she who believed that there would not be that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken by her Lord. So this story, we, we all know this story. It's just a, a poignant story that uh, Mary went to visit Liz, Elizabeth, and it says when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. This, is, this story of just, this gives us this power of the existence of Jesus Christ. And the fact, this connection between John and Jesus, and how, uh, just how emotional that is, and what it did to the mothers. And you can see here that it says that when the baby leaped in her womb, it says she was filled with the Holy Spirit and she cried out with a loud voice. And I hope we, we realize that when it says cried out in a loud voice, this was an exclamation of joy. This was not just her saying something. This was her just, just barely able to contain herself, that when that happened, she said, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And, and it's just like, uh, I'm so thankful that you're here. It's like, how is it that, how is it that I'm so fortunate that the mother of my Lord would come to me? What a special moment that we, ha we have here that we're, that we're experiencing and she told her about the baby leaping in her womb. And it says in verse 45, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. This is, this is just demonstrating the faith of Mary and Elizabeth. Both of them had this miracle happen to them. And, how, and it just says, what great women believe when something like this happens. That, they, that it would be fulfilled. Not only that they had this experience that they learned that it would happen, but they believed that it would happen. There's almost this, there's this almost a little snide point there, like, um, you know, her dad didn't, I mean, or their dad didn't, but Elizabeth did. Mary did. They believed. Zechariah had trouble grasping it. But it says, blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And I think we need to make the point here that, first of all, at this point, Zechariah is still mute. Uh, this has been months going on, and he is still unable to speak. None of this is normal to them. I think we need to make sure we understand that this is a monumental event in their lives. They're, they're uh, being pregnant with these babies, the connection between these babies, the, the announcement of them, it is all just a, a miraculous moment for them. Now, if we go down to verse 57, and remember, and, and it is difficult for me, I will just tell you, to try to teach this and focus on John the Baptist, because everything we study here, I'm sure for you too, makes me want to go off on a, on a tangent to talk about Jesus and talk, that's what I want to do, but we're going to keep on reeling back in that we're, the story we're talking about tonight is about John. And so in verse 57, it says, now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. Just a, just a good moment that they know that this is from God, and that they know Elizabeth. They know that she wasn't going to be able to have a child unless God was part of it. And they were all there, and they were just rejoicing together. And I have to tell you, this, reading this verse reminds me of a very personal moment in my life that is unforgettable. And I told you that Missy and I, um, we had fertility issues for uh, years, and it was a very stressful thing. And we decided we would adopt. We decided that it was time that we, we thought maybe someday we'll have biological children, but let's go ahead and we, we like adoption. We want to adopt. Let's do it. And so we were fortunate enough to, um, after about nine months, uh, it was told to us that our son was born, that Andrew was born. And in fact, they called me on the phone. I remember I was at work. I worked for Bruce Baird at the time, and then my phone rang, and a guy said, hey, Todd, just wanted you to know your son was born yesterday. That was how it was announced to me. And um, my reaction was, well, how, do I, how do I parent a baby? I, have no, I was not prepared whatsoever. Missy had bought the books, and I pretended like I read them, and I, I was like, pretending like I was getting it, but I was, at the time that Andrew was born, 
I thought, man, we're going to have to get probably like eight or ten bottles for the week. You know, we probably, we're going to need probably 20 diapers and maybe eight or ten bottles, and we'll be good for a couple weeks probably. I had no idea that's a day's worth. I was, and I didn't do nothing. And in fact, we had to call a friend because we didn't have a car seat. We said, we got to go pick up our child tomorrow. We, we need a car seat. We had to go borrow one. So all that to say, we went and we picked up Andrew and we drove home with him. And when we arrived at home, our house was full. It was full of people that were there to rejoice with us. They knew what Missy had been through in particular, that the emotional journey that we'd been on, they knew that we had been wanting a child, and when we were there, our friends and relatives were there, and they were there to rejoice with us. In fact, there may be some people in this room, I don't know who in this room was there, a Dawson was there, wasn't he there? He, four-month-old Dawson was there, anybody else here, in, was, was anybody else here there? Okay, well, you're the only one, special guy. You didn't expect you'd come up in class tonight, did you? Um, but when they, and then when they left, it, it was, it was just amazing. It was, it was, it was and we went home and there was stuff in our front. But this moment to me is, I just wanted to point that it reminds me of that moment, this joy that came to them because not only was Elizabeth having a child, but this was a child from the Lord. And I have to say, that's what we thought too on that day. I think we thought God delivered us, Andrew. We weren't able to do it on our own and he delivered us Andrew. So even though that really doesn't play into our story of John the Baptist, I just thought it, it, I wanted to continue to accentuate Elizabeth and Zechariah and Mary and Joseph and, and what was going on with them in their minds during this time. Now in verse 59, it says, and it happened that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to call him Zechariah after his father. And yet his mother responded and said, no, indeed, but he shall be called John. Now, I don't know how this worked. I don't know why they went there and they were being told what they were going to name the child. I guess the, uh, the, the priest or, was saying, oh, we will name him this. But they said they were going to call him Zechariah. And it says Elizabeth had to say, no, he, he will not be named Zechariah. He will be named John. And they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who was called by this name. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him, him called. And they asked, he asked for a tablet and he wrote as follows, his name is John. And they were amazed. I love that, that this, this part of the story is told that she said his name is going to be John. And they said, well, why would you name, who's John? Why would you, why is it so special that he would be named John? And they said, well, let's ask the father, Zechariah, get him, get him something to write with. And he wrote down, his name is John. Uh, that's, that's the fact. And it is to me almost like he said it like, this is the truth of the matter. That's what his name is. It's not what we're naming him. God told us this is his name. And what happened immediately? He wrote, his name is John. And what immediately happened? He could speak again. Why? <laughs> that, that's, what, that's what was told. That's what, the whole point of this was you will be mute until that day. And now, he, he is now, I, I don't know what to say, rehabilitated, but he has now the proper attitude toward this, and he says, God said, his name is John, and this, uh, this now allowed him to have that removed. At 64, and at, what, and at once his mouth was open and his tongue freed, and he began speaking in praise of God. So this is one of those things, and you see this at times when a person is, <clears throat> debilitated or having an issue or very ill, and in this case, mute, the first thing they do when they are able to is praise God. And that's what John did. I'm sorry, that's what Zechariah did. He said, as soon as he was able to speak, he just started speaking praise to God. And we see that with sick people that are, and people that are raised. and pe they, they go off immediately praising God. And in verse 65, and fear came on all those who lived around them, and all these matters were being talked about in the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them kept them in mind, saying, what, <clears throat> what then will this child turn out to be? For indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. This is the reaction they have now to this moment. He is born. He is, they, 
he is named John. They see this miracle of, of Zechariah being able to speak again, and it says it just causes a stir among every place. It just it gets spread around in this moment. And what they're saying is, <clears throat> excuse me, what they're saying is, what will this child turn out to be? I feel like this played into their, a little bit into their um, fear, <clears throat> where they say, what is this child? Look at what happened. Look at all of this. What is this? What is, what is he going to be? We need to be? We need to really pay attention to this. And it says, they're saying this, for indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. And then just to move on, it, it, then in verse 80, this is really, uh, how, this is the transition that's made. Now the child grew and was becoming strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. This is kind of like when you're watching a movie and they need a whole lot of time to pass, and they just put up some words on the screen. Well, this is it. He was born, and then it says, he grew up, was becoming strong in spirit, and lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So this tells us that he went out and he went to his place. He went to the wilderness and grew up in the wilderness. We learned before that that likely took a Nazarite vow where we learned with his parents that, that he would not cut his hair, he would not have any uh, wine uh, or, or strong drink, uh, not be in contact with dead bodies. Those are the things we expect would be part of this vow that was made to dedicate the child, to dedicate this child to God. So I want to transition now. I just wanted us to understand where he came from. There, there's only one other story about the birth of a child that has more detail and more intrigue than this one. This is, it is, I think, interesting to see that the birth of John is covered to this level of detail with this much of excitement, with the announcement of an angel, and with the word of it just being spread all over, all over the place. Everyone knew about this and saw what had happened, and they were all amazed by it. So let's turn over to John 1, and I'd like to use John's account for us to step through, really, what happens next with John. We, I feel like we just cannot ignore how um, important his foretelling was, the prophecy. This was a person that God had planned. God knew that it would be needed, and God had planned for this to happen. And I think it's interesting that when we study John the Baptist— Sometimes we start in verse 6 of John 1, but I have found it very interesting that one of the more well-known verses in the Bible in John 1 is what leads into the story of John the Baptist, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life and life was the light of mankind, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. I wanted to read that because you will see as we study John's account of John the Baptist, it all launches off of this. To say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and it talks about in him was life, and the life was the light of mankind, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. This segues now into the story of John, because this is God's plan for the preparation for this light. And so in verse 6 it says, a man came, one sent from God, and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Let's stop there and just talk about this introduction about who he was. There's so much here about how important he was. First of all, the first thing it says about him was that he was a man sent from God. He was a true messenger of God, not just that he was a man that God took and sent. It was almost like God had planned for him throughout eternity, and now was time for him to be born and to fulfill his purpose. That's how important he was to this mission. The idea of what he was doing here, it says in verse 7, he came as a witness to testify about the light. Now you understand now how 
important it is that we've read the first five verses of John 1 to understand that verse, where it says he came to testify about the light. In verse 4 it says, the life was the light of mankind, and the light shines in the darkness. He came to point to the Messiah. And that may seem like a small job, but his job was to come and point people at the Messiah. It says in verse 8, and this is going to be repeated multiple times here in John 1, just this account, and definitely in the Matthew account, he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. This needed to be clarified by John the writer. What kind of a stir did John the Baptist cause when he started preaching in the wilderness? A big one. There were lots of people. It said, there were crowds coming, it said. There were, everybody was talking about him. In fact, when people would come from a long way and ask questions, they would, they'd heard about him, and they asked him questions, and they would test him, and, and it certainly was a stir in Jerusalem. And this idea that he was doing this and what he was preaching, it was making a big stir. And when people, when it, we're going to actually study it here in a moment, when, but when people talked about him, they had guesses as to who, who he was. Who were some of the main people that people guessed he was? Elijah was the first one, in, in fact, which you can understand because Jesus said, this is Elijah. Uh, so that he was very directly related to the spirit and, the, and this mission of Elijah. What else did they say? Are you the Messiah? They also sometimes said, we'll look at this in a minute, are you the prophet, another prophet? This was a lot of people thinking maybe this is the Messiah, and maybe rightfully so. I, I, you could understand why they would. I mean, he was out there, and he was preaching and had with, with some authority. He was baptizing, and he'll get asked about that here in just a moment. But John points out, this wasn't the light. He came to talk about the light. His whole life's purpose was to talk about the light. He needed to clarify that he was not this light. In verse 9, because remember he says, he came to testify about the light. This was the true light that coming into the world enlightens every person. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not accept him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I want to touch on this a little bit. This doesn't necessarily move our story of John's life forward, but this, we certainly should point out that this is what John was preaching. The light comes in the world, and it says it enlightens every person. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, and yet the world did not know him. This is... This statement we, we kind of smooth over sometimes, but what it's saying is he made the world, but when he came here, what happened? They rejected him. That to me is something that's so common maybe to, to conservative Christians like us, people who study the Bible um, frequently, but this is a huge idea that the creator of the universe came and the world rejected him. And in verse 11, he came to his own, his own people. They were his, and they did not accept him. But then it says, but, if, but to those who did, to those who received him, they have the right to become children of God. And, at this, and this really, to me, drives this point home. Not born of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but the will of God. This, to me, is this story of Ephesians 1 which is God predestined us. God planned for us, it, you know, throughout eternity, God planned for us. God planned that we, that what would happen with us. Would we be Israelites? Are we going to all be Jews? Is that God's plan? What did he say would happen? He predestined us to what? Adoption as sons. This is, the, this is the same concept that says God planned that we would not be children in blood. We would not be able to become children of his by our own will. God adopted us into his family, and we were able to be part of his family. This is the, this is the message. 
that we could become children of God. That's a big thing because certainly there were children of God in Israel, but we now can become children of God through receiving Christ. Let's look at verse 14. It goes on to say, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. I don't want to, I want to just look at that one sentence just for a moment, because this tells us about the, the savior that John was preaching about. First of all, it says the word became flesh. We, I think, don't give proper recognition to how foreign a concept that would be to this audience. The fact that God would become flesh. In this culture, in this society, throughout history, there was no connection between flesh and God. That the word becoming flesh was a part of God's process, but not a part of the other gods, not a part of the, uh, the mindset of the people of what they saw in God. God becoming flesh didn't make sense to them. And it says he dwelt and dwelt among us. And it says his, uh, we saw his glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I think that's another thing that would have been foreign to them, that the Savior, the Messiah coming from the Father was full of grace and truth. Now, we just finished uh, an excellent study of grace, the grace of God. And I, it certainly plays into this. When we talk about a person having grace, when you see a person who is graceful, there's a different connotation there. What does it mean when we look at a person and say they're full of grace or they're a graceful person? Are they loud and obnoxious? Are they overbearing? Are they a bull in a china shop? Do they come in? You know, do they, are they a person who is disruptive? This, I think, talking about Jesus says this is the picture of Jesus' people. They are full of grace and truth. There's a quietness to that. There's a control to that. Yes, Mr. Adams. Jesus didn't come into the world to become the person for his benefit. He came to be one who have people become children of God. But he was just the vehicle, but not the reason. He came to save that. He didn't do it for himself. Yeah, he, he, did it, he, he did it not for himself, he did it for, for, for others, but he was the one who it was through. Sorry, say that again. He was thinking about himself, not about himself, but thinking about us. And so the, the, there's a picture there that says this is, when God came in flesh, it wasn't to glorify himself, it was as a gift. It, it, was, it was for us, not, he didn't need the benefit, it, it, it wasn't for himself. And so this idea here of Jesus, the, the nature of Jesus to me is really important. And we're going to continue this topic here as it goes through. It says that uh, we saw his glory, glory as of the only father, for, son from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and called out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who is coming after me is proved to be my superior because he existed before me. For of, for of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. Let's stop there just for a minute. He says, this is, about, this is him who I was talking about. He is superior. What reason does he give here that Jesus was superior to him? There were multiple reasons, but what reason does he give here? It says, he proved to be my superior because he existed before me. And that's an important, that's an important point, that he says the, the superiority of Jesus in this one case is because he has been here throughout eternity. I have not. He existed before I existed, and I, did, and I have not. And it says in verse 16, for of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Christ. No one has seen God at any time, God the only Son who is in the arms of the Father. He has explained him. I want to talk about just this, because this is the message that John is teaching. And he says that he who is coming after me is my superior. He has existed throughout eternity. He is God. And it says 
he gives us grace upon grace. And there's an emphasis being put here about the, the grace of God. And when he says grace upon grace, there's almost this idea that he's saying he's giving grace on top of grace. It's more, and what it tells us, because he goes on to talk about the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. This idea that says, God has been graceful throughout history. Jesus was not the first time God had grace. Was not the first time God was a graceful, merciful, loving father. He has always been that. Now, Jesus comes and we're putting grace on top of grace. The law was given through Moses. It was, it was from God. God gave that law through Moses. But grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. And that to me is so important about John's message. That's what's so different about John's message. He is teaching about a Messiah that's coming that is full of grace and truth. That's what's being realized through Jesus Christ. It's not a military conquest. It is not the, the taking over of the world with an army. It is the bringing of grace and truth. And I feel like it's really important for us to understand that that's the distinction that's being made about this Messiah. Jesus is coming, but he is a person that is compassionate and loving and full of uh, ideas that, that move people and that change lives. The idea, like the story of when he brings the children over and says, you know, the, I, you know, I want the children to come to me, and, and all of us need to be like children. These were concepts that made no sense to them. But Jesus was, grace was his definition. And that his example of that is to me an example of what Christians are supposed to be. I, and I couldn't think of a good way of saying this. There's probably a book that, that says this, but this concept of Jesus coming is if love became a person, is what he's saying. If that hasn't been a book, we need, it seems like a book we should write. Um, Jesus was if, if the concept of love became a person, that's what Jesus exemplifies. That's what they're trying to, that's the connection that John's trying to make here. That's how different Jesus is from the law. The law came from God, and it was all about this ceremonial, ritualistic law following. Jesus came and exemplified love and gave that example for us. And then the last thing he says here, and he says, and, and, and I find it, I found it confusing the first few times I read through this, where he says that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. God the, God, the only Son who is in the arms of the Father, He has explained Him. There's other versions that I think say declared Him. This is telling us, how is it that we go about seeing the Father? No one has seen God. No one knows what He looks like. No one has, any, no one has seen God. How do we go about experiencing the Father? Well, Jesus has declared Him to us. That's what kind of God we have, a God full of grace and truth Jesus came to exemplify that and teach that to us. So I wanted to make sure we looked at that. The Word became flesh, and He was the Messiah, but it's so important for us to realize that what He was doing was exemplifying what this new law was. It was people who were full of grace and truth. Now let's go ahead and move into verse 19. Let me make sure we have time for this. Let's go ahead and look at a few per verses here. In verse 19, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites to him from Jerusalem to ask, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny. And this is what he confessed. I am not the Christ. And so they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Tell us so that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one calling out in the wilderness, make the way of the Lord straight, as Isaiah the prophet said. And, we're gonna, and we'll continue on there. But to me, we, I wanted to make sure, we talked about this already, but they came to him. They saw him preaching. He was having success. He was, people were 
listening to him and being baptized, and it says, who are you? And it says, I am not the Christ. That was his answer. Who are you? I am not the Christ. Well, then who are you? Are you Elijah? No. Are you a, a, the prophet? Which, you know, that some people think it might have been, Deuteronomy 18 talks about a prophet that would come that they might have thought was a different prophet, or Elijah. Even though Jesus said he was Elijah, he says, no, I am not Elijah. Um, they said, then who are you? And he used that verse to say, I am the one in the voice crying out in the wilderness, make the way of the Lord straight. The, like I said, the very simple goal of John the Baptist was point at Jesus. So as we go through these next, uh, these next few verses next time, and we look at what he was actually saying and doing, and then what Jesus was doing, I I've, I've have trouble in my head realizing Jesus was out there too. All this story of John the Baptist and what he was doing and baptizing, Jesus was alive and was out there. And so when he showed up, and we see that story of him showing up, um, this wasn't the first time that anyone had ever seen him. But we see what, what John had to do and the preparation he had to make. And his whole goal there was just to point to Jesus. And there were, I feel like there were other things there too. That there was, he was associating himself with Jesus. He was preparing people for Jesus. He was um, validating Jesus. He was showing people what was coming and how important that was. I'll just tell you a quick story before we're done here. That I had a job to do a few years ago which was I uh, was working with a company. My company was hired by AT&T, the company AT&T. Anybody here work for AT&T? Okay, good. Um, and my job was to go around the country and stand in front of a room full of people that were angry and try to get them not to be so angry because the product was so bad. That was my job. And I would stand in front of a room full of people, and it was, um, was it like five, six hours of the, of the day? It was, it was about five or six hours I had to stand in front of a room full of people. And they sent me out um, to go and be an ambassador. And that's not an easy job. Now, I, this job of John the Baptist is exponentially harder, but being with people that don't want to believe, and you have to listen to them, and you have to try to change their minds and then spend a day trying to get them excited about something um, where that in the very back of your mind, you're, you're thinking this product is not good and I'm going to regret this. Um, the end of that story, by the way, is they ended up killing that product and I looked like a moron. But I, I went around to 20-something cities and did that. And there is something about going out and a person standing there and making a case and listening to people and trying to passionately change their minds, that, is, that can be effective. And I only say that, tell you that story to say that John's job was an extremely difficult one. And he took it with great humility that he not only went out and did this very difficult job that certainly could have been life-threatening, but he constantly spent his time just pointing to who was coming. I'm not him. One is coming that, and we're going to see him say it. One is coming after me who, whose sandal I can't even unstrap. I'm not even worthy to unstrap. I want us to think about that as we start to see the beginning of his ministry. He, he was pointing to Jesus. He had to prepare people for Jesus. But part of that was turning them. Part of that was taking people who had turned from God and turning them to repent getting them to focus on Jesus so that Jesus' ministry, so that Jesus' gospel could be effective. And so that's where we're going to start on Wednesday. This is Sunday, right? On Wednesday, we're going to start and look at what he taught, the people's reaction to that, and then even after that, when he and Jesus were out and baptizing at the same time, what people said about that and what his goal was. So we'll continue there. I appreciate your comments tonight, and we'll look forward to studying with you all on Wednesday.